forever. Dog. Hi, Anna. Hi, Andrew. And hey, everybody else. Welcome to Scary Scary Stories Stories to Tell on the Pod. A podcast all about scary stories, urban legends, and true frightening things that have happened to you or other people who exist in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's a little corner of the time in your day to be spooked and think about scary things and to feel a little bit scared. I really want to set that to music. It's the time of your day <laughs> to be a little spooked. <laughs> but the underscoring is just uh, three old women humming. Yeah. <laughs> Did Ziggy Marley sing the Arthur theme song? Someone oh, I don't know. It. Jason was singing it. I, it was just a very positive song about like things being possible. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, he would he would sing it. I got the Gummy Bears theme song deeply stuck Ooh. in my head. Um, and actually... <laughs> Our friend Ro Hartramp, one time I like brought it up and then he sang it. He has, a, he has a beautiful voice. He sang it gorgeously and perfectly with every word intact. Like he just knew it and sang it beautifully. And I was like, that's wow. a beautiful song. That was a camp song. <laughs> Gummy bears bouncing here. And that, that song, that show is insane. I didn't watch it. My best friend from growing up, Hannah, watched it. That's I, a, I've been on the outside looking in on Gummy Bears. Okay. Oh, wait, no, I just mixed it up with Care Bears. Oh, okay. Care Bears and Gummy Ugh. Bears. Right. Is the, wait, so you sang a song at camp? You sang that, like, The Gummy Bears theme song was one of the camp songs. Oh, my God. Anyone who went to camp knows what a camp song is. It's a song that you sing at camp. It's part of the canon. And Gummy Bears was there. It was I one of them, that. and I always felt like, why is this one of our songs? Someone's, yeah, someone's uncle was, yeah. was, had a hand in that. The In case you didn't know, um, the... Th- Gummy Bears is sort of like prime cocaine-fueled Disney from the late 80s, early 90s, which is that they are um, sort of Renaissance Fair bears who uh, pluck gummy berries and turn it into juice. And then they drink the juice, and the juice makes them able to bounce. And that is a – that's the the plot of the show. Must be so weird to write for a children's show. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know how – I like I just know from like – from from the nightmare of pitching where it's like anything strange, people are like, mm, unpack that. You know, like let's really talk about that. Yeah. Are people going to be confused? Right. And then to think that Disney execs were sitting there and someone was like, they're bears. They live in the Middle Ages. They pluck berries. They turn it into juice. It makes them bounce. They fight ogres. And like – And the response was, why are you still here? Get in a conference room. <laughs> Get me five Jews. Make it. <laughs> I mean, all those like uh, Tailspin. Did you ever watch that one? Yeah. It's like okay, everyone loves the everyone loves the animal characters from Jungle Book. Imagine they live in a seaside community where everyone gets around via biplane. Why is it just now occurring to me that that is a weird show? <laughs> that like I did watch it as a kid and I was like, yeah, yeah, Tailspin, yeah, right. Jungle Book in plane. Nobody ever asked where Mowgli was. <sighs> he was working at a bank. I don't know. <laughs> He was busy. That's Um, so correct. Yeah. What a weird time. You should have a separate podcast by yourself. (laughs) I do feel like they're speaking of – today's an urban legisode and there must be some urban legisode truthers out there who are like, what is – what was happening with those cartoons? Um, There was a show called Bonkers, Darkwing Duck, also very strange. Like let's have it be Batman but he's a duck, you know? I mean I guess it was like people were given the duck – they had to do stuff with ducks, and they were like, "What about a yeah. Batman duck?" But he's not. I don't know that he's in the same universe as as um, Ducktales, or is he? Right in. Let us know, guys. Tell us about ducks and the nineties. <laughs> Why were ducks people? We've covered we've covered a lot of duck material in this podcast. I think their um, whole body is a neck. How were they ever anthropomorphized? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Um, okay, well, it's your turn to do an urban legend. It is my turn, and I'm I'm actually going to use this amazing book that was given to me by my friend Paul. Um, it's called The Vanishing Hitchhiker, Oop. American Urban Legends and Their Meetings by Jan Harold Brunvond. Um, and 
interestingly, so there's this like huge appendix at the back of every scary story it's on the dark book um, and regularly featured in like the sources and notes and bibliography is this book. Oh, yeah. Which is really cool. It's cool that you have it. Where I did know. you get it? Um, so, yeah, my, my friend Paul gave it to me. It is out of print. Um, and he just had a copy, and I feel very – I don't know. He gave it to you recently? Yeah, for my birthday. Oh, that's so um, nice. And there are notes in in here that I don't know whether they're his or not. They appear to be college notes. Um, but I do love that on <laughs> just one page in <laughs> in red pen, it just says Zeitgeist. Underlined. underlined. <laughs> it's the first thing. It's on the first page at the very top. That's um, so great. Yeah, you should absolutely look this book up. It is super interesting. I've learned a whole lot about urban legends, not the least of which that um, Dear Abby and Ann Landers have had a major hand in spreading urban legends in America. Really? Because there was no real way of source checking things. So people would write in and be like, I heard that, you know, you shouldn't flash your brights because gang people, like that's a gang initiation thing. You know, like there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of like those stories that were first featured or like were just oral tradition stuff. And then someone wrote it into Ann Landers or Dear Abby. And then it became like in print and people use that as like, it's real because Ann Landers said it. Oh my God. Um, But oh my, just like, listen to these chapter titles, the classic automobile legends. <gasps> The Hook and Other Teenage Horrors, Dreadful Contaminations, this is my favorite chapter title, Purloined Corpses and Fear of the Dead. (laughs) Together? Together. All in the same. Um, And I'm going to go a bit off my typical brand today. Okay. And this urban legend is not a supernatural one. Um, and it's a bit of a gross out one. Okay. Um, it's gonna it might it's gonna have an upsetting name, and I'm sorry in advance. Uh, the urban legend is the Kentucky Fried Rat and other oh. nasties. My first reaction is that that sounds good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> like I I wouldn't not. Don't isn't it like a um, South American like neutrino neutrinas the giant rodents that people eat? <gasps> Probably. And that, I know guinea I feel pig like is a, a thing. Oh yeah, that people eat them. I know. They look like they're meant to be eaten. Well, the ones that you would eat are not the same that you get at the no, store. Yeah, they're yeah. like different. These are beefier. They're beefier. Um, okay. So this is the – so what's also great about this is that um, the source urban legends are listed in here. They're like transcriptions of interviewed people who are like, tell me the story of this thing. And then like a college student or like a Midwest mom or like a uh, um, you know a mechanic from Detroit like tell the stories. That's so great. Um, so this is uh, – this story comes from a Washington, D.C. nurse uh, who was the brother-in-law of – oh, no. This – the narrator of this um, is the brother-in-law of a Washington, D.C. nurse who told this story. Two couples stopped one night at a notable carryout for a fried chicken snack. Wow. Oh. It's bold. Notable. Hey, do you want to stop over for a fried chicken snack? Oh, at the notable carryout? Yeah, we just had lunch, but I do want something to hold me over. That's <laughs> great. Let's stop by. The husband returned to the car with the chicken. While sitting there in the car eating their chicken, his wife said, my chicken tastes funny. She continued to eat and continued to complain. After a while, the husband said, let me see it. The driver of the car decided to cut the light up oh, to cut the light on. And then, it, oh, I see. To cut the light on is like to turn the light on. Okay. It's a car thing. We wouldn't understand. Yeah, we don't. Um, And then it was discovered that the woman was eating a rodent, nicely floured, and fried crisp. The woman went into shock and was rushed to the hospital. It was reported that the husband was approached. Where she exploded. (laughs) (laughs) Into three women. Now they're they're all all married. Bitches who ate while complaining. (laughs) What a stupid whore. (laughs) <laughs> it was reported that the husband was approached by lawyers representing the carryout and offered the sum of $35,000. The woman remained on the critical list for several days. Spokesmen from the hospital oh. would not divulge the facts about the case, and nurses were instructed to keep their mouths shut. And it is also reported that a second offer was made for $75,000 and that this, too, was refused. The woman died, and presumably the case will come to court. Why did she die? That feels suspect. I mean, that to me is like, I guess she went into shock and her brain broke, you know, and then everything just shut down. Yeah. Um, So that's like, that's like the origin. That's like the origin version. Um, But then there's an alternative to this, which is often called the rat in the Coke bottle story. Uh Um, And... (laughs) 
Uh, this one um, comes from a student at the University of Minnesota who says, Two old ladies stopped into a restaurant to have a little lunch, and they both sat down and made their orders and ordered 7-Up. It came in the old green bottles, and they were sitting there and each poured themselves a glass, and they were chatting away a as glass. usual like old ladies do. I know. How posh. Where? No ice. Where has a bottle and gla- – oh. I guess like – Glass bottle? No. Yeah, like a glass bottle and then you're at a diner and they give you a cup. Okay. You know? Different time. Um, uh, they poured themselves a glass and they were chatting away as usual like old ladies do and uh, and they finished their first glass and one of them was pouring a second glass of 7-Up. And all of a sudden she noticed something kind of toward the bottom of the bottle and she just couldn't quite make out what it was. So – They started looking at it, trying to figure out what this thing was at the bottom of the 7-Up bottle. And finally, they tried to pour it out, and it came out, and it was a decomposed mouse. And they both fainted, and they were both revived later on. And after they got home, they sued the 7-Up company, and they made thousands of dollars in the lawsuit. (laughs) This is just a happy story. (laughs) I know. know, That's not a bet. Like, if, if I drank a little bit of mouse, and then I passed out, and then I woke up, and I got thousands of dollars, that would be a net positive day for me that was like my best case scenario <laughs> in college um, so here's the thing this story definitely plays upon um this book talks about like a lot of urban legends in america have to do with cleanliness because there's like this huh. obsession there's like an american obsession with cleanliness that is also um uh counteracted by like the fact that Americans are kind of sloppy yeah. um, so that it creates this like tension between those two things and these urban legends pop up. Um, so it's like very clear that like these are things that obviously would scare people. But then these there have been so many cases, um, court cases presented of mice, rats, and frogs, in particular uh. in bottled soda uh. and canned soda. No. One of, some of which are like from 2012. Uh. In fact, on on the website The Verge, there is a headline that just says, A Brief History of Rodents in Soda Containers. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Um, yeah, October 1994, uh, there was a, uh, a case presented um, where there was a rat in a can of Diet Pepsi. Uh, That was discovered in Orange County. The FDA investigated. Uh, The FDA spokesperson Rosario Quintanilla uh, Viewer said, we did find the rat in the can. (laughs) It was in pieces, but it was there. Oh, boy. Um, uh, Meanwhile, Pepsi officials denied that they were the source of the rat infested can, suggesting instead that this was a hoax and an attack against the company. It's tough for anyone to know how the rat or mouse got into the can, but the FDA gave our plant a clean bill of health. Ann Ward, a spokesperson for Pepsi, told the LA Times. Ann Ward. (laughs) It's Um, Ann Dowd. (laughs) We did find a mouse or rat. Um, That was just a little (laughs) dose. Um, um, Then in January of 2012, an oil company worker named Ronald Ball called Pepsi and told the company he found a dead mouse inside his can of Mountain Dew. Um, Ball filed a lawsuit against Pepsi for $50,000 in damages. Um, now, Pepsi's attorney, which this is, a, this is a thing that very often soda companies will say when they are accused of a rodent being in their soda. Very often. I can't believe this is a thing. Yeah. Um, uh, this article alone lists 12 cases, and then I found more <laughs> cases, uh, some of which are listed in like CNN and ABC. <laughs> um, um, so the affidavit uh, from Pepsi's attorney um, trying to dismiss the case said <laughs> – that uh, even if a mouse had been in the can, it would have been dissolved into a jelly-like substance after 30 days due to the citric acid. Oh, my God. <laughs> Buddy, you're not helping yourself. I know. No, our stuff is so gross, it would have ate the mouse so fast. <laughs> Don't worry. Keep putting it in your body. But then food scientists, including a food scientist named Massimo Marcone uh, at the University of Guelph. Wow. No. Guelph. What do you Where's think that? they study there? I think it's just mice and soda. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, 
uh, Dr. Marconi said there would not be enough acid in the matrix of the can to actually start causing those physical changes in the mouse. The mouse would start to spoil. There would not be enough, but there would spoil. not be enough acid to preserve the mouse. It would start to smell bad. But to say that the mouse would actually dissolve in about 300 milliliters of soft drink, it's pretty hard. Prove it. <laughs> Prove it, Dr. Marconi. <laughs> then if we want to go stateside, um, another food scientist, Yan Fang Ren, uh, who's a researcher at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, told Scientific American that Mountain Dew might be able to dissolve a rodent over the course of months because the citric acid that contains it uh, can erode teeth. But the mouse wouldn't just disappear. A container of the soda would still have the collagen and the soft tissue oh. part. And it would not pour out. It would be like rubber, he said. Oh, um, God. I, I hate to keep collagen. going. Collagen. I hate to keep going, but I will do one more. Um, And this is about Frog and Pepsi. Um, (laughs) um, No. (laughs) And this one is At least I don't like Pepsi. All these stories have been Pepsi products. It's true. Wow. This is a conspiracy. As as Jacqueline Novak would say, someone's controlling the narrative. (laughs) Oh, I want to see your show. Oh, you got it. Hey, everyone. We're Mike, Scott, and Jason from Podcast The Ride. On our podcast, we discuss the world of theme parks and themed entertainment. Animatronic bears. Fake rock work. The logistics of theme park parking garages. So please check out and subscribe to Podcast The Ride only on the Forever Dog Podcast Network. New episodes every Friday. Um, okay, so um, this is a CNN.com. I just love very much that this is the headline. FDA says residue is frog or toad, but how did it get in a, in a Pepsi can? <laughs> That's like teaching a, an algorithm how to make sentences. Do you want to see a picture? It, you, it's, you don't really get a sense. It Scale just looks one gross. to ten, how bad is it? Um, it looks like barf. It doesn't look like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> so ten. <laughs> it ah. looks yeah. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that, okay. It looks like um, like curry. Like if you bought tikka masala sauce in a jar <laughs> from a key food, and then mixed in some. Uh, I guess the only way you'd call it is frog parts, and then poured it out of a Pepsi can. So this story comes from Ormond Beach, Florida. Um, Fred Denegri, who is fifty-five, was <laughs> ready to grill. <laughs> Oh, Fred. Ready to grill for himself and his wife, he popped open a can of Diet Pepsi to sip while he cooked, but one swig of the cola was enough to put him off his meal. At the time, <laughs> this is uh, Fred's wife, Amy. At the time, I asked him, and he couldn't even describe the taste. He said, I've never tasted something so awful in my life. <laughs> so the crazy thing about all this is that uh, the Food and Drug Administration does allow for certain um, – Amounts of it. bugs no. and rodents to be allowed in things. Um, uh, for instance, uh. in a chocolate bar, the FDA says uh, uh, it allows one out of 200 parts to be uh, insect fragments. That's too many. <laughs> I'm not Aaron Brockovich, but I'm going to say that's too many. <laughs> Honestly, I would watch that Aaron Brockovich movie. <laughs> that's too much bugs. Eat the chocolate. <laughs> Eat the chocolate. If you're, it's if it's not if it's not too many bugs, then eat the chocolate. You're this just is a, <laughs> one in two hundred bug parts and ugly fucking shoes. <laughs> They're called bugs, Ed. <laughs> it's a perfect movie. Um, look at this. This is this is ABC's headline. Uh, uh, ABC News headline: A frog in your drink can be emotionally distressing, and that's what uh, he was suing for was emotional distress. Can be. Yeah, I um, guess that's the only thing you could sue for. Yeah. Oh. There's, yeah, there's a, a. They also allow um, one rodent hair per 100 gram sample of any food at all. I guess that's what it has to be because men won't lift a finger around the house to like take over the unpaid labor. In, that it's all been outsourced <laughs> to like large corporate. I do think that this is what the fear is about of like yeah. the the fried rat and like that stuff is like. <gasps> oh, right. Women are supposed to cook all the food and now they don't anymore, and people are like, "That's fucking weird." And it's also like it's also like it's always and except in this this poor guy, it's always like a woman being like, My food tastes funny, and the man being like, Just eat it. <laughs> like that's that's a big part of it too. Um uh, but just one last just one last Please. thing. In in defense of uh Pepsi bottling company, 
Um, their whole thing is like it is virtually impossible for that to happen because they're they're saying like the way in which things are bottled and packaged, like it, there is they're completely covered f- um, from the time they're made to when they're shipped. Uh, they are rinsed out by highly pressurized water seconds before soda is put into them. But what if there's rat in the water tank? That's a good point. Also, it could be like a a like distributor being like I'm putting a rat in the soda. It this is a good case, and I, I honestly the damage that this story has done to my brain. Now I do feel like I will pour soda in a can into a glass, and and maybe and maybe drink more clear soda. <laughs> I can't tell you how many cans of soda I drink on a daily basis at my job. I just remembered something. What? Um, uh, I I won't I won't name her in case this is like uh in case this is like a secret that's not supposed to be said, and I won't name the ice cream company. But oh. there was a particular you- brand of ice cream uh, restaurant on the corner of Broadway and Astor Place when we were in college. Ice cream restaurant. Yeah. Um, the place where we would go and have fights with each other? <laughs> no, no. It was a brand. It was a chain. Oh. Um, and I had... <laughs> I don't um, know. We both just <laughs> mouth things off mic and neither we of have, us... Did. We have no idea what it... Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't mouth it without making this out. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, oh, how about this? How about this? Um, <laughs> it rhymes with smold spoon. Um, and I, I had, forgot there was one. I there. had okay. a I had a, a friend of mine, an old room, an old roommate of mine, who worked there. And um, through the grapevine, she had she had said like there would regularly just be a frozen rat. Ah! <laughs> um, now I'm not that that does not reflect on on smold spoon. Oh. Um, uh, I think that has more large. to do with doing business in, in New York. New York. City. I, I think any if you're getting ice cream in New York, sorry, a rat has a rat has died in your ice cream. That is like the difference between being able to live in New York and not is like oh, the yeah. comfort level you have with rats touching things that go in your body constantly. Endless. Yeah. So yeah, it's no no shade. I still do go to this establishment, not the one. They in do New York. so much mixing in. You're kind of asking for it. <laughs> number one. Number two. There was that story. Were you the one telling me about this? The like. The Just Salad in Rockefeller Center, which I go to. No. I have been to that more times than I've talked to my grandma in the past, <laughs> like, 10 years. Um, I eat a lot of their salads. Um, they closed down permanently because there was a lot of bad press about them. Chelsea is now very upset because I feel like she has had these salads, too. Uh, there was so much bad press about them having. The uh, yeah, there's a salad in a suit sitting out there looking really angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the CEO of Just Salad is a salad. Uh, hi, I'm Just Salad. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> that's perfect. It's halfway between Jeff and Jess, and I think you know that. Um, but so they got bad press for having so many rats. In the, people kept posting cell phone videos uh-huh. of rats in the Jess salad, and instead of like punching back, the head of Jess salad said, "Yeah, it's in a fucking subway station in Midtown." Yeah, I don't think he said that, but it was like. Anywhere that's underground in New York has rats, and we closed because we were unable to fight off the goddamn rats. I think that's right. The, I think that's. I think I that's the correct. I still eat food answer. from the concourse literally every day. There was a deli near NYU when we were in school called Delion. Love that, Delion. That got closed down because cleaning solution was found on their disposable. Um, cutlery and i was kind of oh. like i'd rather that they clean them off i think they i think that they yeah. just were kind i don't know whether oh. I, I don't think that they were like directly spraying the, that makes no sense they took them out I of can, the trash and cleaned them <laughs> oh my god i didn't even consider that possibility that was my first thought in my head it was just like they were like cleaning the windows or whatever and they weren't caring where the stuff was spraying you know what i mean i don't think that's a good reason to close Dalian, and i do think that it's now like a um what was that one bad place? That's like a salad place that's bad. Jenny's? No, it's whatever. We're it's just fine. talking shit about. We're just talking about shit about a place next to NYU, which is the most hateful thing that's ever happened. <laughs> but I liked Delian a lot as a child because, as a, an NYU child, yeah. because they would tie a little ribbon around the hoagies, that's like the true. subs. It was very sweet. It was like, kind of decorative don't, ribbon. Um, yeah, like this wasn't food grade ribbon. This was no, just straight no. up. Like glossy four year old's birthday party ribbon. 
Um, and I liked that extra touch. Yeah, it's a really good one. Cleaning solution on um, forks. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's my gross urban legend for today. That's a really good one. Thank I you. really I think we're doing a good job of branching out. Yeah, there's a lot of these and there and this book is going to be a real treasure trove for us cuz there's endless amounts. Thank you of, so much friend Paul. Yeah, it? Paul. Thank you friend Paul. Friend of the pod. Um, um yeah, that's it, I think. Man, that's really good. Please um have you ever found an animal or buggy in your food? Um, I'm sure I, I have. I used to know how to read books and now I talk <laughs> like this. <laughs> I'm sure I have. Um, I mostly just get pooped on by animals a lot. I got, I got a, a homicidal bird dump on me at JFK. I had just oh. got, I had just gotten out of, a, the tr- out of an Uber and I, oh. I was like walking to the, like right under the overhang and a, and a pigeon just downpour on my <laughs> Jean leg, and it was so much that my leg instantly felt wet. Like it, like <laughs> went through. And then a woman I did not know came up to me and was like, "You've got to get rid. You've got to wash that off right away because pigeons uh, have uh, parasites in their poop that can go through your skin." Uh, and I was, I, it was just like such a stressful thing. And I was told getting, me about that. yeah, it scared me so much, Andrew. I immediately pictured that the pigeon was following the car the whole way and that that was his first chance. The whole time. The pigeon gets back to its hotel room and cashes the check. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. God. Whichever one of you paid that pigeon, I'm going to get you. Things like this happen to Andrew. I don't know if people are aware. Andrew is sort of a um, conduit for odd Social interactions, and I am including birds shitting on you yeah. as a social interaction. Yeah. Oh, there are plenty more to come. Wild, um, weird people, um, the elderly saying kooky things. Yeah. Animals behaving uh, extraordinarily. Um, and sometimes it is it is impacted or increased in intensity when I'm with other people who that happens to them as, to, uh, them as well. Mara Wilson, yeah. Emily Schmidt are both people who if Emily I'm with Schmidt, them, something absolutely. insane will happen. I feel like you and I also have that too. I think I might – I don't have – I don't know. I think you're just such a lightning rod. You and Emily. One time, one time Mara and I were walking down the streets of New York and she was like, not like we're we're hanging out like something crazy is going to happen to us. And then a man came up to us and said, didn't I meet you ladies on Mars? And then walked away. Yeah. And truly we were just like, okay, well, that feels appropriate. (sighs) Man, um, yeah, that's dangerous. You guys should never. Uh, you're like X Men, but yeah, but, but lower you never stakes. want this power. <laughs> yeah. um, before we go, I just want to now that we've got now that we're picking up some heat. Um, <sighs> just want to give another thank you to uh, um, our composer of our wonderful theme song, Chris Ryan. Chris Ryan, who you should uh, hire for all uh, your music needs. He's an amazing composer and also my husband. Um, but he's still great. I'm saying that objectively. They share a life. We share a life together. I know. Chris is the nicest. And also, I, I do think that our podcast is mostly marked by how much better the theme song is than the podcast Oh, itself. my God. It's a true A-rate theme song. The podcast is Kevin James, <laughs> and the theme song is Patricia Heaton. Yeah, that's true. Wait. Are I got you, it mixed Leah up. Leah Remini? Yes. Yeah. Leave me I, alone. I like, I like Patricia Heaton, too. To me, they're um, the same because they both remind me of my Aunt Patty. <laughs> Uh, but he's great. He he he's done all sorts of awesome work. You should check. Uh, oh my god, I'm really butchering this. Because you um, like him, I like him. You should check out his website, ChrisRyanMusic.com. Uh, yeah, he's the best. And also, um, the amazing illustrator who did our cover art, Bats Langley. Um, again, cover art is a cover art. Leah Remini. Beyond the assignment. Beyond Remini. Um, yeah, truly nailed it. Made us look, I think, really good for being scary trees. Oh, yeah. You know, I feel good about that. I feel good about it, too. Um, it's a picture from, I think, 2011 that he based it on. Mm-hmm. And my hair was shorter then. But yeah. because the hair is shorter, you can see more graves. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think mine's from 2014, too. So we're, you know, it's we're doing deep great. Deep. Um, we got more dead since then, which actually is very spooky. Yes, yeah, very spooky. But Bats Langley is so great. Uh, you should check out his website, too. Um, he's just illustrated this amazing. Um, adaptation of Alice in Wonderland and oh. it looks so great. Uh, yeah, he's the best. He also, he and I worked on this series of uh, subway-centric scary stories That's called right. scary, to- scary Stories Real in the Subway, um, which is just like a Tumblr if anyone uses that anymore. But you should Please. check out those illustrations. They are first rate. So Now good. that Autumn nips our heels. Now that Autumn It's nips. really, really good. It's like good. If you miss New York, 
it's really good yeah. to read. Yeah. If you're in New York, it's good to read. And we're getting into the spooky season, everybody. So please tell your friends about us. Um, and yeah, we want to we want to hear your stories. Um, and we're hoping to maybe sometime soon do a live show, maybe even before we Halloween. Would, yeah. Um, tweet about the idea of us doing a live show. Yeah. If you're um if you're a famous person, <gasps> uh, would love would love a tweet. You know? I love attention from people who are more powerful than I. <laughs> Yeah, this is going out to st- – I'm just – this. only these three people, mm-hmm. Brandon Fraser, uh-huh. B.D. Wong, yep. and um, Angela Lansbury. <laughs> well, one of those people has a Twitter. Maybe? I'm going to guess B.D. Wong. Yeah. Brandon Fraser doesn't, I bet. No. Oh. He's too busy with his three boys. Oh, that's good. Ugh, he's the fucking best. Oh, and I do think that we – someone reached out, my friend Haley Kosan, a great director. She asked us to please do the mummy um, <gasps> like oh, live commentary that we talked about doing. We do want to do a live commentary Haley the said mummy. that she would watch it every Saturday morning <laughs> as a child. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Which is a good time to watch the mummy. I That is a great time to watch the mummy. Yeah. Um, speaking of great time to watch the mummy – Anna, this has been a true pleasure. Andrew, thank you so much for this spooky ur- urban legend. And thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, but before you go, get, get out. out. <laughs> Forever Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter and Instagram, at Forever Dog Team, and liking our page on Facebook.